There's great claws and little claws. That's a bad fellow, that man. This is, of course, Harry himself here. But that's very definitely Harry. I think my first memories of him are, are the personal memories of a, of a young child, the sort of the warmth of one's father, which I, I don't suppose I should go into in do, too much detail now, say being held by your father, like ev every child would, would feel, it's common to all children. The sort of the, as he would hold me in his arms, I could feel the vibrations of his voice into, into myself. But I also remember a lot of reflective things from him say the house was always full of his designs going into his studio to see what he was doing this tall figure leaning over the desk working on his designs i think it was just by chance that he chose the macabre i don't think i think it has been overstressed that this was a part of his nature i don't believe that he was far, as I've said, that I think he had so much love of life. Of course, there was uh, you know, the twin tracks, if you like, of the macabre, which he loved and was fascinated to illustrate a literary idea. But I think that may have been the challenge of Edgar Allan Poe or any of the other rather macabre subjects that he did illustrate. But he also took something as, as whimsical as Walter de la Mare's, uh, the song of the Mad Prince, who said, Peacock, by the old king to the sparrow, hardly macabre. It may have been, it may have been, there are, there are stories that uh, one priest, in, one parish priest that he didn't particularly like, he put him in, <laughs> into part of the one of the windows and he didn't put him in with the saved. Whether that's apocryphal or not, I, I don't really know. I don't think it would have been beyond his sense of humour, certainly, not to have put them in as various people in the less glamorous portions of either stained glass windows or book illustrations. No, that wouldn't have been outside his sense of humour. No, absolutely, I think he probably could have done that. fascinated by the idea of evil 
and the way in which good had been perverted by evil and came into close contact with sanctity and in the concept of redemption, which is why he loved doing St. Brendan and Judas. He is, as you say, a Promethean figure, very, very powerful physics, a sort of Blakean um, figure of, of extraordinary potential, um, who Judas, obviously, when, when, when Brendan met him, he'd been there for 700 years. He, I mean, it's obviously a, um, a completely fanciful interpretation, whereas when he was in the Holy Chapel, he tried to show him completely haggard and ravaged and pitied and um, a much more medieval interpretation after he visited the, the French medieval cathedrals. So I think it's a sort of it's a sort of spiritual mythology, and um, that was why I think he had so many misunderstandings with parish priests who didn't really get what they wanted, <laughs> and he wasn't going to give them anything that he didn't want to do. So there was a sort of impasse. I mean, the, the the figurative archetype is obviously very important that you can recognise. I mean, you see it emerging. It starts off with something much stronger and much more solid, um, and as you talk about that Promethean figure, um, and um, there's this incredible burning intensity of the eyes, especially, um, which I think you have all, you know, this is this way that which you, the eyes seem to be sort of great pools of introspection. You have the long tapering fingers, you have little tiny feet, absolutely love footwear. You know, love, we loved doing, putting on marvellous gloves and jewellery and little, uh, very, very decorative footwear. He loved headdresses, couldn't bear doing ears, he, was always cover, he always covered ears. I think he just instinctively, instinctively felt the colours. Blue is a very important colour for the symbolists. It's also a very important colour in medieval stained glass. And it is the colour which he became identified with because he was able to use it in the most extraordinarily powerful way. But he juxtaposed it, juxtaposed it with the colours that were most effective, as indeed he did with black in his book illustrations too. So it's difficult to actually formalise a, a, a psychic interpretation of his work, but people have tried. I think he just was absolutely sick of doing, I mean, his daughter always said he was just absolutely sick to death of doing all these old po-faced saints, and he just thought, well, you know, why don't we really do something that's absolutely all stops, you know, give them bosoms, you know, penises, anything you like, you know, sort of extuberances in every direction. I mean, the devil's wife and her eldest, you know, is fairly um, explicit as a sort of black magic image. But that's not to say that he was practicing black magic or that he was engaging in all sorts of horrific, you know, sort of sexual activities with hermaphrodites, you know. I mean, I, I don't think that is true. That was one of, the, one of the things a lot of people tried to put me off working on Clark at the beginning because they thought I was going to uncover all these terrible secrets. And I don't think there were terrible secrets. I think he was actually well organized. Um, very good businessman and very amusing company. And he's actually quite shy as well, I think. And he just did these among friends, really. And um, and he could draw them, you know. So why not? But it was the only. I think it was the only one. I think it's a sort. Of, I think it's a one off. Although the, I mean, you know, Fast is absolutely stiff with fallacies. I mean, they're everywhere. You know. I mean. The three more significant windows in the chapel are the three westward windows and they represent the principal saints associated with Ireland. In the centre, the green panel, which is primarily representing St. Patrick, is very strong and striking in any light, even in the dark Irish light, which we often get for about nine months of the year. But probably one of the more interesting windows is the goblet window, which is the next window down and that's very strong bejeweled colours in dark blues and reds. And Gavnet um, is the patron saint of bees. She got this um, she got this accolade because while she was administering her monastery in Balaborna, which is in West Cork, just immediately west of Macroom, um, some robbers came to plunder the monastery 
and Gabnet very slyly unleashed all the beehives which chased the robbers away and one of the very strong well-known details in that window are the small hidden faces of the robbers looking very frightened being chased away by these very fierce bees so that's something an image which is often associated with Harry Clark in many publications which one sees about Clark and his life. Colm Killen would be probably the man who is associated with the start of this tradition for the travelling Irish saints and the saints associated with Irish learning. But together, those three saints probably manifest all the, um, the virtues that is held, the, the virtues that are associated with the Irish saints and early Irish Christendom. Well, he was commissioned by the Irish government to make a stained glass window as a gift from the Irish people, people, to the International Labour Office in Geneva. So the window was always known as the Geneva window. It just happened to hit Cosgrave's new government and it happened not to represent what Ireland wanted to project at the new League of Nations um, building um, in Geneva. It wasn't, it didn't conform to Ireland's image of nationhood. <laughs> in 1930. So it went on exhibition in the government buildings and that's where the interference came in. Somebody somewhere brought up something about... I suppose the broadest word would be banning anything that was in any way connected with nudity. There was no nudity. Nobody was ever nude in Ireland. Simply, I suppose, because of the naked figure of Deirdre, but, I mean, she's, she's got a sort of diaphanous veil on her. And um, the playboys, I suppose, they, they, are, they are fairly decadent images. So the windows stayed in Ireland. My mother was... Ap my father died, and he, one of his last letters from Switzerland was, Are my windows going to Geneva? It's like a very solitary, sad little cry from an artist. Home, are my windows going to Geneva? I don't know whether my mother ever wrote to him and said no, but he died then. If it had been done 10 years earlier, I think it would have been all right. And of course, he was dead. He couldn't argue against it. It's much to my regret. I tried to keep it near to the best of my ability, but there were two votes. Why not society? And my brother Michael was living in, in America at the time. So two to one usually wins. So it didn't stay in Europe, but I would hope that sometime it would come back to Europe again. That is my hope, that it will come back. I see no hope for, but that doesn't stop me wishing for and the belief that the possibility is it will come back to Europe, not necessarily to Ireland, but to Europe. I hope so. Thank you.